on time. Uh, we might get delayed uh, as usual, but that's okay. Uh, but I think that this one is going to be a really interesting one. So please, with no more uh, delay, welcome Ben Price on our huge stage. Thank you. I uh, appreciate everyone who woke up early. I need to. Uh, I need to learn to tell the event organizers I'm not an early morning presentation guy. But uh, this is so. This is a long one. Um, building a company in the space, uh, it's it's regulated, uh, and we're trying to do it in the least evil way possible, which I think is is a good thing to strive for. But uh, the real takeaways from this presentation are the last couple of slides. We'll hope we get there. Uh, but it's meant to be shared. It's out on Twitter, so you can always come back and look. So we're going to talk about building a bank. Super interesting, right? The problem is banks are inherently pretty, pretty fucking evil. I mean, I guess theoretically they started as as good things to store your gold, but uh, they've become something very different. So we're going to talk about building a less evil bank, uh, which is what everything is morphed into. And if you're going to do it, do it the right way. That's our uh, that's our theory. Uh, also, alternative titles, you'll, you'll kind of figure this out through here. There's a few segments. Basically, everyone's a scammer, and uh, minimize your rug ability. So, banks are evil. Banking system, governments, fuck over people. They have forever. Why are they evil, though? Uh, so we're going to just, like, quick hit. You guys know You guys know why banks are evil already, but we're just going to, like, fucking list the reasons in case you don't. Uh, so, money laundering. I tried to give a, a quick example of, uh, of things that have happened in the pretty recent history. I'm not like even that knowledgeable about banks, but like we all know that they're, they're scammers. So you got the Deutsche Bank one. If you're a terrorist, you can just go through them. Uh, Mortgage-backed security fallout. No one went to jail. Uh, companies like Wells Fargo are always fraudulently opening accounts. They literally did it to me. They closed my checking account. They reopened a savings account and charged me more for it. Freezing of funds, ATM withdrawal limits, that's fucking lame. Uh, excessive KYC, so the, there's, a, there's a problem where uh, banks do whatever they have to do uh, to, to satisfy the regulators. Um, there's, there's usually gray area, which we'll get into, but people go above and beyond what's necessary. Minimum account limits, maximum account limits, you can't have too much money or too little money. Monthly transaction minimums, they, kill, they don't even give you savings or interest but you can't even use your bank account for savings anymore because there's, there's literally minimum transaction amounts. Uh, negative interest rates are soon to be possible with CBDC, but uh, today you get what, 0.000001% on your savings account? Uh, cool, especially when inflation is, is at all-time highs. It's ridiculous. Uh, Rehypothecation, we all know that one. It's, a, it, it's an incestuous system over leveraging there's literally no more fucking reserve requirements for banks in the United States. I don't know about banks everywhere else, but you know, emergencies happen and you don't need to have any money to lend anymore. Uh, politicians on payroll, again, it's et cetera. So building a bank, it's fucking lame. Who, who cares? You have a bank, everyone's got a bank. No one wants to do it. It's, it's a fucking evil business. Um, so we're gonna talk about building a less evil bank. Again, everyone's a scammer, remember that. Uh, so we're going to talk about why everyone's a scammer. Uh, it's not banks. It's literally everyone. We all know this. We've read the article, um, but it's true. Um, so we've got, <laughs> we've got FATFA, oh, those fuckers, uh, the, w <laughs> the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, literally like paying off countries, destroying their citizens, and in the process having back handshake agreements to tell their citizens Bitcoin is bad. Like, give me a break. You destroy countries. Uh, chain analytics, these are some of the worst, worst people. Um, you've got, these are a couple of examples, there's more, but these are the real bad guys. Chain analysis is a big one, Coinbase, TRM Labs, Elliptip, Cypertrace. Uh, I was in the rooms when they came and pitched these people, the, they're like, they're pitched to compliance officers at Visa. It's a really good pitch, they scare you. Uh, terrorists could use your blah, 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 this could happen, this. They, they literally just scare compliance officers into going to lawyers and slowing everything down and using them. Um, and we'll get into why, like, 
they're worse because it's pay to play. You, if you, if you want to use them, you have to share your data into a collective honeypot. Um, you don't just get to use most of these. You have to give all of your user data up to get some of their user data. Um, there's human rights issues, like freaking Coinbase Analytics hired a bunch of assholes who sold their data to dictators and got people murdered. You get to pick who's good and who's bad. Is the president of Nigeria bad? Okay, well don't give him the chain analytics tools. Is he good? I don't fucking know, I literally don't know who it is. Uh, but you get to choose and that's the problem. <laughs> so Coinbase in particular, you know, they come up here and say that they're like, uh, they care about their customers' privacy and stuff. Meanwhile, all these guys, every one of these companies I would imagine is selling to the FBI, DEA, IRS, ICE, literally immigrations and customs enforcement, like what the fuck? Why are you, why are you buying chain analytics tools? Like this is public data, that one was Coinbase in particular, but I'm not gonna name which, but like Visa uses these companies, everyone uses these companies, it's just an easy way out. Uh, wealth managers are fucking scammers, how do you get your 1%? You, they're, they're not incentivized to, to tell you to hold your own coins. They literally are paid by how much money you have in the bank with them. They'll put you in negative yielding bonds before they'll give you Bitcoin because it's assets off their balance sheet. <sighs> then you got the regulators, OFAC, FinCEN, FATFA, SEC. By the way, this is more US focused. We are building an international company, but I'm most knowledgeable about US. So insert your country's regulator here, that's what the, the point is. Like, you, you can't sell above certain amounts, you can't sell below certain amounts. Uh, the gift card industry, I can sell you five $2,000 gift cards, I can't sell you a $2,001 gift card. If you send me $3,000, I have to report a high value transaction. There's hundreds of different little things you can do that make me have to like file an official report with some regulator, it makes money movement more expensive, it, it kills your privacy. These guys are really bad. <coughs> Payment processors. Um, everyone talks about Visa and MasterCard being not good and that they're the ones getting 3%. They actually get a tiny, tiny fraction of every transaction. It's like this whole incestuous system with uh, issuing banks, which are the bank that's on your credit card, and acquiring banks, which are the banks that work for the merchants to accept fees. But at the end of the day, everyone, everyone quotes 3%, that's about what you pay, maybe 2.5% plus 20 cents a transaction. But what you don't know is like, there's fraud and chargebacks. If you, if you charge something back, whether it's friendly fraud or intentional fraud, it's gonna cost me $250. Um, Bitcoin fixes that. That's literally like one of the most unspoken things in the world. It's instant settlement, no fraud, no chargebacks. When you're selling things like gift cards, when you're selling anything, you want no fraud, no chargebacks. But like, particularly these digital goods and digital items, and, and we live in a digital era, so it's very important. Um, you also have delayed settlement. You don't see your funds for sometimes weeks. Um, very high risk. The well, we'll get more into that later. Uh, FDIC insurance, that's a fucking scam. There's literally not enough money if there was a bank run for all these banks. They put up like nothing to, to back themselves. You have venture capitalists who used to have to invest in real companies, uh, but instead now they're doing NFTs or doing crypto, anything to make a quick buck because their buddy runs an exchange like Coinbase. You can list it on the exchange and then dump on retail investors. Being a good VC now is investing in shit coins dumping on retail and getting your money back in six months. It used to be about investing in good companies and it's not anymore. Uh, A16Z is a particularly bad, bad actor. Uh, remittances, these are the biggest scammers. These are the guys that are gonna die fast. Western Union, transfer wise, international payments are not hard. Uh, we know that. I could send a billion dollars to someone in Taiwan in two minutes with Bitcoin. Uh, lawyers and compliance, they just make you, they, they refer you to other lawyers and compliance officers. Central banks, obviously we know they're the ones that are creating the money, they're doing surveillance tools. I think 90% are looking into CBDCs now. Um, they, they hate you, they wanna, they wanna monitor all your transactions. Um, and then payment networks. Uh, constantly interchange is rising. I think Jack talked about this yesterday. Technically, it's pretty much a duopoly with Visa and, and MasterCard. They don't agree on fixing rates, but it's really weird how every time interchange rises for a totally fixed cost business, it happens on the same day at the same time. Uh, it used to cost 2% to process transactions. Now that their user base is larger, it costs three. Uh, it actually doesn't work like that. We all know how technology works, it scales. Uh, it's total bullshit. 
Um, okay, so this is something we have a little insider information on, CBDCs, central bank digital currency. It's a really, really bad thing. Uh, you wanna have cash exist in your society because I can go give you five dollars for, doesn't matter, it could be a fucking blowjob, it could be drugs on the street, it could be a candy bar. The point is I can give it to you and no one knows about it. That's the really, really good thing that we have about cash. Something that we can do on Bitcoin, it's a little bit harder, but CBDCs completely eliminate that. You can get censored for anything. If I tweet out Donald Trump's an idiot, uh, he, can, he can take your bank account. Uh, you can implement negative interest rate policy. Like you can take money out of people's bank account for savings. Uh, you, the point is every, every transaction in the world becomes censorable and it becomes dictatable by someone, no matter who, who it is. Um, this is literally from a meeting. Uh, I worked on infrastructure. All central banks are doing is calling Visa and MasterCard up asking how do we do this, right? Um, you can do, we have a bunch of nerds at Visa. We can do private key, public key, peak, yeah public key cryptography, make it private. We could do CBDCs in a private way, but the way they're thinking about it is a non-starter. It, it literally is a non, you don't even talk about it. it, it it's off the table. Uh, and so that's, that's how your central banks are at, like who they're asking for for advice. Your central banks do not want to give you privacy. Some of them LARP, they say, oh, below 20 bucks, maybe we can do it in a private way. But anything more than that, they want your name, date of birth, picture of your fucking asshole, like selfie, liveness, bullshit. Um, this is real conversations happening right now. Um, again, let me, let me shout out Joe Rogers. The government hates you. Uh, the payment networks actually have more to gain from CBDCs than commercial banks. The central banks have the most to gain, but this is, a, this is an image of what we had today. Today, Visa sits below commercial banks uh, so you go, central banks print the money, commercial banks have access to that money. They communicate with their users, typically through checking accounts, but often just a Visa card, MasterCard, Amex, insert, insert payment network here. So Visa and the payment companies sit below commercial banks. Their customers are commercial banks. They're not to be confused with the users. They really aren't customers. The banks are technically, the users are technically for, with the banks. Visa is just this network that sits in between. This is what they want. So central banks are coming to Visa, MasterCard every day asking, how do we do this? How do we build a CBDC? We hear China's doing it, it sounds really cool. Uh, it's not, but what they have to gain is they get to leapfrog commercial banks. They now sit on both sides of the transaction. So they will be the infrastructure layer between central banks and commercial banks. They're gonna be the ones running the protocol, Visa, MasterCard. It's gonna be a very incestuous small system like proof of stake. Uh, basically, there's going to be five payment networks and a couple big companies. You can insert, you know, evil company here. Uh, they're going to be the ones who get to dictate who is provisioned access to this CBDC, and they're going to want. They're going to be the ones that hold the keys. They're going to essentially be the source of truth who can censor anyone. Uh, then they're going to provision access to each and every individual commercial bank, who is then going to again communicate with the user back through themselves. So they not only get to leapfrog and get closer to the money, they get closer to the central bank, but they now sit on both sides of the transaction, the user and where the money is being printed. It's, it's bad. The, the incentive model is really, really fucked. But that's, that's literally what's gonna happen. Um, so, crypto, right? Build back better. Uh, this, all the same scams that happen in the banking system, we were seeing them play out real time in the crypto space. Uh, this is a Bitcoin only conference and you have to really understand what that means. Crypto is a, crypto means cryptography. Crypto means it's a fucking scam. Uh, so here's some examples. We're gonna list these off. Uh, there's the, the classic ICO token scam, Ethereum, Denticoin, EOS. That created an ROI on scamming. EOS in particular, they raised $4.4 billion in their ICO, uh, clearly illegally, uh, and they got a $24 million fine. What does that tell you if you're a scammer? You make a lot of fucking money scamming people. There's literally an 18,000% ROI on scamming, and that was dictated by the regulators. Affinity scams, stacks, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin SV, uh, pretending like you're real money. Everyone knows this one. JPEG scam, NFT scam. This is OpenSea. Um, you, you buy pictures on the internet. Uh, it's on the blockchain or something, there's, there's NFTs on Bitcoin, there have been, rare Pepe's I think are pretty fucking cool. But 
No one wants a bored mutant starship ape. It's not worth anything. They they artificially inflate the price of these markets, uh, and there is no there is no sell side or there is no buy side pressure. Uh, your your ape is worth a million dollars until you try to sell it. You're fucked. Like good luck getting ten bucks for that thing. Uh, you've got the rug pull scam. That's just taking everyone's money and running away. Uh, there's a there's a few ones that we know. Quadriga, Mt. Gox, Pay. Um, you have to be careful of the future rugs. Companies like Ballet are set up to rug the shit out of you. Make yourself unruggable. Um, these, you really have to watch yourself. Uh, there's the VC scam. We already went over this. Uh, A16Z buys shitcoin X, gets it listed on Coinbase when he talks to Brian Armstrong. It pumps 10,000%. They sell. They no longer have to invest in companies that are doing real things and having a you know roughly 10-year turnaround on your money. You now just scam retail and get your money back in seven days. It's fucking great if you're a VC. It fucking sucks if you're a dumb retail investor like most of us. You've got the proof of stake scam. This is the Cantillion effect. This is how the banking system works today. You scratch my back, suck your dick, you get rich. Uh, the data scam, a lot of uh, companies, Shotgun KYC, uh, that's a really bad one. They, they get you on there and then all of a sudden your money's frozen unless you give them all your data. Um, You've got Coinbase analytics, like the the chain analysis companies. Again, it's a it's a pay to play market. You share all your data to get their data. Um, th there's so many scams, but it's all the same shit. We've seen it all. Uh, there's the media scam. If you're popular, you get access to mainstream media. Fox News talks about you know is Dogecoin going to pump this week? This is all paid incentive models uh, for people who have access to marketing and important people. Uh, they don't care about you though. They want your fucking money. Um, Trading scam, pump and dump, like we've seen Elon Musk pump Doge, we've seen Meltem get in these like secret chat rooms. Anytime you see, you see these like, I'm a talented crypto trader on Twitter, what they're doing is they're getting you into a group where there's five admins who have previously bought Shitcoin X at .0001 cent. They have 5,000 followers and they say on Friday at 6 p.m. we're gonna buy. What they've already done is they bought the fucking token and your little admins who are the great traders are dumping on you. It's who's holding the bag last. That's what's happening. There's a ton of them. Pomp, Richard Hart's another good example. You've got the influencer scam again. If, you have, if you're a big Twitter following, you can make money on, on dumping on stupid fucking retail investors. It sucks for them. Like people, people are just trying to like make a living. Uh, they have to gamble because inflation is so fucking bad and you've got these other people just, just taking their money. Um, lending scam, that one just, <laughs> that one's easy. <laughs> that sells, like the entire market just blew up from a, one company, but there's a bunch of others doing it. Another one people don't know about is blockchain.com, like one of the biggest stupid companies in the world making tons of money though. They almost just went bankrupt. They basically just got bailed out because, uh, and, and they kept it really quiet. BlockFi wasn't able to do that. These other companies literally like blew the fuck up. But uh, quietly, this created, like, this destroyed the market. Like, l lending is ridiculous. We'll talk about that. All the other shit coins, uh, if it's not Bitcoin, it's a shit coin. Get out of here. Uh, literally all scams. Like, let's not even waste our time talking about it. Um, okay, so Bitcoin fixes this. It is fucking hard, though. Like, um, because they're making it harder. Uh, the real secret here is they don't really, they're not great at, you can't stop Bitcoin, but what you can stop is money going into the system and money coming out of the system, uh, the fiat system that is. So moving dollars into the Bitcoin network and out of the Bitcoin network is hard. It doesn't scale well. I have to find you in a crowd and pay you 20 bucks, um, but I can't necessarily connect my bank account and, and buy Bitcoin unregulated in any way, shape or form. That's what they're focused on. Um, Payments are regulated, you have the travel rule BS, they're trying to make not self-custodial, whatever they're calling it now, insert, insert like scam name here. But they're trying to make normal wallets illegal or like make them totally unusable. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't care, it really doesn't matter, this would be fine, but it's gonna hurt incoming individuals. Uh, you've got tax implications in the US, if you spend a cent, you're technically supposed to calculate cost basis. This is a way for it to, them to they're just slowing, slowing down the inevitable, but slowing it down nonetheless. Uh, and then you've got all the media propaganda. Is Bitcoin dead? Bitcoin's dead. Bitcoin's dead. We've all seen it. Um, you've got so many regulators for people like me building all the laws. Like, we can get into these for days, but they, like the barrier to entry here, this is the moat that banks have created. 
Uh, getting an MSB is pretty easy. Getting an MTL in the US at least requires state by state, every single state you go get a license, you put up a bond like you went to prison uh, because you need to protect other people's money. Uh, it's probably $2 million in two years just to like send a dollar for someone. Uh, and then you've got these, tri these other companies or these other uh, unelected officials making rules that are technically not law, but the banks will bank essentially shut you out of the system if you, uh, if you decide not to play. Um, so just build non-custodial, like yeah, fuck yeah, do it if you can. If you can build non-custodial peer-to-peer stuff, do it, it's way easier. Um, but you're not gonna even make a bunch of money anymore if you build a custodial exchange. You have to build services and experiences around your business that make it better. We can talk, we'll talk about the progression of banks and, and what that means, but now you have to fight for user experience. I don't make money on exchange fees. You shouldn't make money on payments. It's lightning, it's free. It's Bitcoin, it's free. You can send a billion dollars for a fraction of a cent. Um, oh shit, spoiler. Uh, so these are all the other reasons. Uh, Non-custodial options are great for people like you and me in this room, but they're really not probably great for people like my mom. Uh, running a node is really hard. Seed phrases are hard, like who, what, what is writing down 24 words, like what, that's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a big UX hurdle. Lightning liquidity is hard, privacy is hard, account recovery is a disaster, auditing code is hard. I don't, I, this open source stuff, I don't fucking know what's going on, I'm, I'm too stupid. I'm, luckily I live with Ben Carman, he's a smart guy and tells me what's a scam and not, but like no one's actually auditing this code if you're sharing. So again, we're talking about building a less evil bank. Um, that was, how banks are evil, how everyone's a scammer. We listed out all the ways crypto has basically tried to replicate all the real life scams we've seen from banking. But if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna build a custodial solution, how do you do it right? How do you do it less evil? Uh, Sharon also doesn't run a fucking node. This is my favorite person, it's my mom, someone we all need to build for. We need more Sharons in the space. Mom, if my mom can use it, it's usable. Uh, but she doesn't run a fucking node, guys. She thought I was mining in the house when she found the node that I was running there. Uh, so build for Sharon. This is Sharon. This is your target market. Uh, this was Sharon trying to sit in a chair in our driveway. Uh, she's not gonna run. She's not gonna run a, a Raspi Blitz in her house. Like she's she's gonna use Venmo. She's gonna forget her password. She's gonna write it down. So these are why custodial solutions are necessary to bring more people into the space, and then hopefully you can lead them on the right path. Uh, normal people don't Bitcoin, there's this whole chicken and egg problem. What came first? Is it merchants or consumers? Uh, it's fucking consumers. No merchants are spending the time to integrate Bitcoin point of sale things without, with five users who are demanding the payment. So our thesis is you gotta get more you gotta get more consumers into the market and that's probably gonna happen with custodial services. Isn't there, she, my mom's not downloading fucking Zeus wallet. I'm sorry, it's just not gonna happen. She, she has Cash App, she has Venmo. Uh, she actually just learned what Venmo was and she was like stunned. Um, so again, build for sharing. There's, there's a built-in incentive system. There's a 3% fee, which is actually probably more like seven or 8% after all the fraud and tooling you have to do. Uh, you, can, you get instant settlement with Bitcoin and no fraud risk. The big thing is you get paid today and there's no such concept of a chargeback, which if you're building a business like me, you, chargebacks will literally kill your business. Um, so that isn't a thing with Bitcoin. It's 3% to accept a Bitcoin or to accept a credit card transaction. It's probably seven to 10% of my bottom line to handle all the fraud and risk. Um, you can give her money for paying in Bitcoin because it saves me 5%. I as a merchant can, can, I, as a merchant can give back to Sharon. I can give you 5% off if you pay with Bitcoin than if you pay with a credit card. So I'm, I'm probably about to run over, but uh, we're, we're almost done. So again, build non-custodial if you can. It's way fucking easier. You don't have to deal with the regulators. Your users can do whatever you want, but we need to bring more people into the network. That's, that's our responsibility. But with that power comes responsibility. You, you don't wanna build an evil big behemoth company. We're trying to do this the right way. If you're gonna do it, be less evil. So these are the last three slides. Uh, these are the ways that we think um, as a, if you're going to build a custodial wallet, a custodial exchange, whatever, uh, there's like 50 things you can kind of do to make it as best as you can. Uh, you still got up to KYC, but the, the most important thing, whoops, I think I, uh, the most important thing is trying to break connections of users' funds. Uh, if you're gonna KYC Joe who works at McDonald's, fine, you might have to do it. But 
The whole point is to give him privacy on the way out. Let him buy his fucking Bitcoin. Take his picture if you have to. Um, ideally not. Minimize everything. But on the way out, don't care about what he does with his money. It's cash. It's his. You already KYC'd him on the way in. He works at McDonald's. The money's fine. So break, break the connection. You can do this with blinded withdrawals off the exchange. Uh, you can fight for privacy laws. There's a lot of gray area with regulations. Do reasonable things. The big exchanges just sell out to chain analysis companies because it's considered reasonable because they're paying off politicians who say chain analysis is reasonable. You can build, you can build your own in-house tooling and tools. Uh, if you're going to get subpoenaed, what they're going to do is they're going to ask you for data. We have we, you could make it cryptographically impossible to understand data about your users. Uh, it's also the problem with data honeypots, but okay, so we're gonna just quick hit the last like things. This presentation is available live, but if you are building a custodial wallet or a custodial exchange, we're about to list about 30 things you can do at a bare minimum, which make it the least evil thing you can do. Definitely enable lightning withdrawals. Lightning is much more private. Uh, Fediment, this might even satisfy the, the travel rule, but again, a really great thing for user privacy. Instead of withdrawing directly to your non-custodial wallet, Get an anonymous token and then go withdraw from them at a later date. I don't care what you do with it. Uh, Off-ramp solutions, companies like mine provide gift cards, Visa cards. You have the sell side problem solved. You can actually sell Bitcoin and buy Airbnb, American Express, Uber cards, Visa cards, mer insert merchant here, as long as you stay below certain amounts. This is a non-KYC option that you can give to all your users before you kind of like upgrade them to a KYC tool if they want. Um, this is a big one too, fuck chain surveillance. You're probably gonna have to do something, uh, re something reasonable uh, to protect against money laundering and things. Um, but don't, don't use the honeypot, build it in house. You're a fucking startup, you're building things, do it the right way. You can, you can do reasonable things to protect against money laundering uh, that Deutsche Bank and UBS and all these other fiat banks already don't do. Uh, and you can do it the right way. You don't have to share all your data and be a cuck. Uh, again, this is the last slide. Uh, I knew I was going to run out of time. So other things, don't be an asshole. If you get rewards, give, get, give them back to your users. That incentivizes more people to use Bitcoin. It gets them off zero. When their Bitcoin rewards go up by two instead of their discover miles going down by 10, uh, yeah, that, that makes them ask questions and hopefully gets them onboarded. Don't be greedy. Take money from good investors. Bad VCs create bad incentives, don't give away too much of your business, call out scammers, being toxic is good, Bitcoin maximalism is truth maximalism, some people can't get comfortable with that, they're usually fucking scammers. Uh, educate your users, call out scammers, call the fuck out scammers, fight for your privacy, give back to open source, there's a huge free rider problem, companies like OpenSats exist, it gets 100% passed through to free and open source Bitcoin projects. These people are the smartest people in the world maintaining software that we're all using that's epic for humanity and they don't get paid. Don't let Facebook go pay them. Give them, give them your sats back. Um, push on compliance. Everyone needs to stand together. Uh, if you attack Hodlnot, you attack a million plebs. That's how we stay strong. Uh, use good terminology. Uh, Collaborative transactions, not coin joins. Um, that's the last piece too. Uh, this is important. Privacy is a right. Uh, don't make, don't make it, don't let people make you feel bad about wanting your own privacy. Uh, these are just collaborative transactions, which me as a businessman help you give you. Pro it saves me money. It saves me time. It saves me money. And a, an effect of that is that you also get good privacy. That's all it is. Don't, you're not a fucking terrorist for wanting to use your, your money privately. That's what they're trying to make happen. So that's, what, that's the most important piece. Uh, and I think, I think that's it. Sorry I went over. <laughs>
beautiful. Oh, this feels like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I really wanted to sleep. I got to note to self in a future conference, when you're flying east, come like six days before. I think I fell asleep at 7 a.m. And don't let someone in the room who snores. <laughs> this motherfucker. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of seats in the front here. If people want to like sit, anyone, you know, like there's people standing and shit. You can fill up the room a little bit more. So, I, um, sorry for anyone who was in Bitblock Boom because I did this talk then and I didn't really have time to prepare. But I'm going to just do it again. So, um, the world's in a funny place. Uh, we, we, uh, I was, couldn't sleep last night, so I was downstairs at the hotel just watching the TV. And the amount of woke bullshit that I saw on the TV, like one minute was, oh, there's a energy crisis and it's all bad. And then the next minute was a bunch of actors going to Gorbachev's uh, uh, funeral and you know pretending like they're crying and shit. Um, and then there was a bunch of Greenpeace fucking hippies throwing rocks in the ocean. <laughs> and then there was something else and I was like, man, this is fucking painful. And it just kept going on and on. And it was the same thing over and over again. And I don't know if my clicker works. Which way am I supposed to point? Okay, apparently I don't have a clicker. Oh, no? There? No, it's not working. I'm too short, man. See? Oh, there we go. Oh, shit. This is very professional. Anyway, so we have two options for the future at the moment. <laughs> we have a communist future. And I'm going to start the talk with this just to depress everyone for their Sunday morning because I know you're all tired and you all woke up early to hear me come and talk. And I guess when I, when, when I think about the world, someone asked me yesterday, they said, what, how bad do you think things are going to get? What's going to happen? And when I, when I look at the world and see the trajectory we're on, I think about a couple things. Um, number one is just, well, what does communism mean and what are the predicates, what are the... the uh, the ingredients that make that kind of a future possible. And Mark Moss and I, we wrote a book called The Uncommunist Manifesto uh, recently. And in doing that, I had to read the Communist Manifesto multiple times and give myself brain damage and then try and heal myself afterwards. And what I found was that the whole ideology of communism, it really is c kind of centers around a couple ideas. One is this idea of dependency. And I, I'd put the word infantilization in there as well. When you look at the, the there's a Ten Commandments inside the Communist Manifesto in Chapter 2 towards the end. And each of the, the ideas or each of the commandments or each of the suggestions by Marx and Engels involve the removal of agency from individuals. It is the placement of that agency and that responsibility onto the state. So let us handle education. Let us handle uh, social safety net. Uh, in other words, you know, what savings used to handle. Let us handle the family. Let us handle uh, communications. Let us handle transportation. Uh, let us handle the money. Uh, not many people realize that uh, number five, point number five in the Communist Manifesto is the establishment of a central bank that manages all credit and money in the country. And people think, you know, the West is uh, somehow capitalist, which is a big load of shit. So this dependence is something that we see rising up in the world today. Uh, the World Economic Forum, the, the UN, uh, all governments want you to give up your agency because it's apparently good for you and because we're all in, we're, we're, what's the word? We're all in this together. Um, we'll own nothing and we'll be happy. It's funny, I was on a, I was on a plane ride from Dublin to Latvia when I was flying in here and I was sitting next to some girl who was a doctor and she was trying to convince me that vaccines were a good idea. Uh, I think I convinced her otherwise and she felt pretty bad about taking her three doses. Um, even though she was, uh, she didn't speak English very well but we kind of had a good conversation and, and one thing I said to her, I said, look, human beings are adaptable and we can adapt to two things. We can either adapt to freedom by growing by learning to manage risk, by learning to manage danger, and becoming bigger, larger versions of ourselves. 
And we'll make mistakes along the way. There's gonna be there's gonna be screw ups. We're gonna things are gonna be messy. We're gonna make mistakes. But we'll become stronger and more responsible along that path. So we can adapt to freedom by growing, or we can adapt to safety by essentially becoming slaves. And I got a lot of heat in the early days uh, for calling out all the stuff during uh, the corona scam, particularly in the early days. I think some of the earliest people to get angry about this publicly was like me, Francis Pouillon, Saifedean, probably Giacomo, wherever he is. And you know, a lot of us got some heat, and now here we are two and a half, three, Jesus, three years later, um, almost, since that time. And what we were talking about was reminding people not to adapt to safety, because safety is, number one, your responsibility. And that's actually, when you think about Maslow's hierarchy and you know, how human beings are structured from a needs perspective, that's the lowest need of all. And, and what we're doing is we're idolizing safety. We're idolizing certainty. We're idolizing these base needs or these base values for humanity. And what we're doing is we're inverting. Like, the human spirit wants to reach upwards. It wants to progress. It wants to take on more responsibility. It doesn't want to be dependent. It doesn't want to be uh, a victim, a perpetual victim, because that's, once again, what communism sort of suggests, is that you, as a human being, are useless. Um, you need help. Uh, only we can help you. Um, you can't do it yourself. And if we all somehow amass in this collective uh, version of ourselves, um, everything will be OK, um, which obviously is bullshit. Uh, a couple last things I'll mention here is uh, the, the mediocrity and the lowest common denominator. And I've talked about this a lot when I've bashed uh, democracy. Who thinks democracy is a good idea? Anyone? OK, all right. So some of you have read my, read my shit. OK, democracy is a fucking scam. All right, it's the dumbest idea ever. It's this idea that if uh, if only <laughs> enough of us voted, apparently, uh, to do something with other people's resources, then the world would be a better place. Um, so I think that's a really ridiculous idea. And effectively, I mean, democracy, communism, socialism, all these sort of forms of collectivism are flavors of ice cream. Uh, democracy is probably just the vanilla flavor, so you know, people don't realize how bad it is. But th they all they all transform into what I call the tyranny of the lowest common denominator. Meaning that instead of people striving upwards, we want to cut people down either to equality or what naturally just ends up happening is that because people are rewarded for being average, you know, you, and you hear this in our language today, you know, the average man, you know, uh, don't get too full of yourself, you know, don't get too big or you get chopped down. Like it's, it's, it's almost become part of our language. We don't, we don't value excellence or greatness anymore. And I think, you know, it's particularly up to people in this room, uh, Bitcoiners, people that actually still have a backbone and still want to take on responsibility um, to really buck that trend. And I hope that what we wrote in the book, and if this click is going to work, and we go to the next slide, we'll get out of this phase of depression. And I, I even sound fucking depressed talking about this. I'm going to fall asleep while I'm doing it. Um, can I please get a next? Somewhere? We're doing well. Okay, it looks like we're going to be stuck in the communist future. I'm sorry. Okay. No, we're not. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the uncommunist future. So, it's funny. People ask me, why the hell did you name it the Uncommunist Manifesto? And we're actually, Mark and I, we locked ourselves in a room to write the book uh, in early January of, uh, it was of this year. And we sat down and we started writing. And we're wondering what to call the book. I was thinking the Individualist Manifesto, you know, the Naturalist Manifesto, the Capitalist Manifesto. All, and all these names just sounded fucking retarded to me. And we were sitting at dinner with his wife uh, that evening. And she said, why do you call it the Uncommunist Manifesto? <laughs> and we all just like looked at each other like, fuck, that's a great idea. And that's sort of what this has come out of. And I think that the word just says it. I mean, we want to be un communist. We want to be uncollectivist. We want to we want to basically live and behave and act in all the ways that are counter to that. And for me these are the key words that come up. I mean sovereignty, I don't have to say it. You know, everyone here has probably read uh, the what's the book by Rhys Mogg, Sovereign Individual. That's right. It's in the name, of course. Everyone's probably read that book. Uh, if you haven't, obviously read it. But 
sovereignty is something we're all seeking. And I mean, we have the keystone for sovereignty here with the money. And that is fundamentally, it's, it's one of those things where it's not, people always, you know, argue, they're like, oh, well, you know, if you fix up the money, then what about the energy? You know, if you don't have energy, then how are you going to run Bitcoin? Or if you don't have food, what are you going to do to eat? And what's important to remember is that it's all of these things, but really the keystone, and if, for those who don't know what a keystone is, you know, when you build a bridge, the keystone is the, the, the stone that goes in the middle and holds it together, is the other stones are still necessary for the fucking bridge. You can't have a bridge with just the keystone. Um, but Bitcoin kind of locks that all in together. And I think, without sounding too uh, utopian, is that I think this is actually a fundamental shift to anything that's happened before. Because we've gone through phases of collectivism and back to individualism, and we've done this so many times throughout human history. We just keep doing it. And, you know, funnily enough, we just don't learn from history. You know, that book, The Fourth Turning, which I think is atrocious, but they did have a point in there with respect to the phases and the seasons, particularly from a, a generational standpoint, is that the younger generations, they get more and more complacent and entitled, and you know you kind of do the whole generation skip thing, and you get the, the strong men create good times, good times, weak men, weak men, bad times. And we're definitely in that chapter three, and that in itself creates strong men, but I wonder what happens when you introduce something like Bitcoin, which I like to call it responsibility go up technology instead of the number go up shit, because number go up is fantastic, but we've all kind of been wrong for the last year. And there's a bunch of people that are all fucking salty and you know drinking hopium every morning, thinking that we've got the bull run coming around tomorrow. Who gives a fuck? Think about it as parallel money, put your wealth in there, and don't degrade yourself by accepting fucking toilet paper funny money issued by a bunch of bureaucrats. That's what I kind of tell people when it comes to Bitcoin. It's not just about getting rich here. Um, although we will get filthy fucking rich in the process, but that's, that's, that's secondary. So sovereignty is what you are trying to achieve as a, an individual who wants to own their own lives. So sovereignty, liberty, or freedom. I think liberty and freedom for me are kind of one side of a coin. So I am free, for example, to, uh, you know, when Pablo's snoring, to get a pillow and suffocate him. Um, but it would be irresponsible of me to do so because, you know, we made a decision to share a room, um, not gay, just putting it out there, just so everyone knows. Um, I'm married, okay, um, not to Pablo. And the, the, the responsibility side of the freedom equation is extremely important. And, and I think, you know, philosophies or thinking like Austrian uh, economics have always talked about this, is when you, when you are free and you are in a position of liberty and freedom, what you need to develop is some sort of restraint and an ability not to go out there and infringe on other people's private property or infringe on other people's being or on their self. And that requires becoming a responsible being or becoming mature. And for me, like, everyone talks about Bitcoin as freedom money, freedom money, freedom money. And I've been, you know, guilty of that for a hell of a long time. But once again, I come back to this notion of responsibilities that without responsibility, freedom is fucking nothing. In fact, one could even argue freedom is evil without responsibility because the thing, they bound each other. And you can't have uh, one without the other to, to live in a moral world. In fact, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, like, morality may be the perfect blend of freedom and responsibility. And that's what we as responsible sovereign individuals want to develop in ourselves. And if, if there's any takeaway from this entire talk, um, other than falling asleep, is think about uh, the responsibility element. Um, what else do we want in an uncommunist future is the self-organization. Uh, I always think about self-organization when you try and get a bunch of Bitcoiners to decide where you're going to dinner. Um, no one actually fucking knows. There's about 10 options. Everyone starts walking in different directions and they all find themselves at the same place. It's like this weird consensus thing. And funny enough, uh, central planners don't believe people can self-organize. Uh, they think that without them, like in the absence of a central planner, in the absence of a government, in the absence of a central bank, uh, we will die of starvation. Uh, we will not know how to make clothes and wear them. We will have no shelter. We'll have none of these things because we are apparently too incompetent to do any of this ourselves. And you know, me and many others have called bullshit on that. And we think that a world in which individuals are responsible to take care of themselves, their family, the things that matter to them, we will figure all these stuff out. 
another piece is family. I mean, I, you know, I grew up with a broken family, and for many years I was like this young, stupid renegade saying, you know, family's for losers. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna live to 500. I thought I was gonna put my fucking brain in a vat or whatever the hell else I was gonna do. And um, and I, di I didn't ac appreciate the um, the bonds of family. Now, what's interesting is in the Bitcoin space, a lot of people have developed uh, relationships that are like family. Like that, you know, you've you've got strong. And I mean, I've seen a lot of strong brotherhood. I'm sure there's some strong sisterhood, but I don't know. I think there's more catfighting in that realm. But there's there's a strong brotherhood uh, in Bitcoin, and these are the communities like building that skill, being able to build relationships with people who have similar values. And, and I'll kind of leave you guys with a thought here on this: is people talk about finding like-minded people to be around, and I also call bullshit on that. I think you need to find like-valued people. You want variant minded so you want someone who's an engineer you want someone who's a artist you want someone who's maybe not a leftist um you know you know may maybe more you know uh, concerned with people's welfare i don't know you, you need the nice people somewhere um but, but you want different minds right but you want similar values and and i think that's what when we're structuring the communities of the future they're the things that we want to focus on you want to bring people with similar values along with you for the ride. And I think that's something that the Bitcoin community really shares well, is like a really strong sense of uh, values around responsibility, freedom, uh, self-selection, uh, sovereignty, etc. And, you know, obviously these last two, excellence and greatness. And I think these are, these are really big. In my reading of late, um, I've, I've been spending time just kind of thinking about the ancients that came before us like 2,000 years ago who marched from you know Macedonia to fucking Egypt you know with horses and sandals and they marched for months across now these days we get annoyed if we have to walk to the fucking restaurant around the corner in Old Town because there's like some cobblestones and it's like a three minute walk um, and we have to catch a scooter just in case you know we might break a sweat um, we have we have amplified the importance of the average man. And for me, I don't give a fuck about the average man, honestly. I don't give a fuck about the masses. I don't care about being equal. I don't care about we're all you know, one and the same or any of that sort of stuff. I respect and admire greatness and excellence. I respect and admire those who are willing to reach for something greater and willing to push themselves because that's what inspires the next people to do so. And as much as you know, some people may not want to hear this. It's those who are great and excellent across every different dimension that actually raise the bar and they raise the standard and they effectively raise the tide which all the other boats uh, swim on. And I've spoken about this in the Remnant series that I did um, when I wrote those. Just out of curiosity, has anyone read the Remnant thing? Okay, cool. All right, bit of the room. So this, I think, was an essay. I mean, it came from a, from a place of just... I know it, it was a mixture of like sadness and annoyance at the world, and I was annoyed at something that people would always say: "We need mass adoption. We need mass adoption. We need mass adoption." I was like, "No, we fucking don't. We need selective adoption. You don't like if you remember from the Matrix. You don't go and fucking unplug anyone. You unplug those that are ready to be unplugged. And this is what I implore Bitcoiners to do: is find like-valued people, spend your time on them." and build strength in the communities that we're building because we will set the Bitcoin standard and then all the lemmings and all the masses and all the people who have no fucking idea what's going on, they're going to wake up one morning on a Bitcoin standard and they're going to be happy. Um, versus all those same people, they'll wake up in a world full of gulags and CBDCs and fucking QR codes on their foreheads um, so they can go and eat, and they'll also be happy because they ain't gonna have a fucking clue what the difference is. So it's not on them to decide. It's not we're not gonna vote ourselves into a better world. We're actually going to establish it ourselves, and we're gonna make it the standard because we're gonna be more responsible. We're gonna be smarter. We're gonna be better. We're gonna be more excellent. We're gonna be more great. We're gonna be fucking rich. Um, all of the things that they want. So that that's what leadership is, and. If you're going to take anything away from that, that's what you want to take away from this, is go and build a business. Go and write a book. Go and inspire others. Don't try and um, 
Don't jump into the la- don't jump into the lava with the fucking lemmings, right? Because they're they're marching on their way, and you know they they've been told do this, and they'll you know walk right off the cliff. Um, you're not going to save them. Go and save the ones who are ready to listen. So that would be my final uh, point in this. And I wonder if I've got. I think I do have another slide. So I'll go really quick quickly through this one. So what can you do? Uh, claim your autonomy, as I've said. Um, understand what's going on. So. I mean, I, I don't think anyone here falls for the bullshit that you see on media. I mean, but if you do, I mean, don't. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Um, continue to educate yourself. Read. There is a bunch of incredible literature coming out of uh, the Bitcoin space. Uh, a couple of uh, my fellow authors are here somewhere. I think Knut, um, wherever the hell he is. Uh, Prince is here. There's incredible books, obviously, written by people like Saifedean, by VJ, that, and that's just in the Bitcoin space. It's, it's, it's funny, there's this whole like renaissance of writing and thinking that's happening here, and that, that alone should tell you something. No one's writing books about philosophy, about fucking Ethereum, you know what I mean? It's not happening there. Or Cordano, you know what I mean? It's all happening in Bitcoin. So, so that, that alone should tell you something. And then share that education. I mean, you know... We, when we wrote the Uncommunist Manifesto, we wanted to emulate the length and format of the Communist Manifesto because I think one thing that gave that book uh, a lot of, uh, what's the word? Huh? Appeal. appeal, yes, appeal, thank you. Um, one thing that gave that book a lot of appeal was its length. It's an hour read. And I mean, it's the fastest way, as I said, to get fucking brain cancer. But it's a one hour read and it makes a, a justification for entitlement like it's an academic justification for being the worst version of yourself. And people lap that shit up and they're still reading it today. Like I, I read somewhere, and I don't know if this statistic is true, but it's apparently the most widely read political and economic treatise in the world. Like, and you wonder why the world's fucking backwards. Um, there was a book written in the same year called The Law by Frederick Bastiat. And you ask the average person, you know, the average person about that, um, no one's heard of that. Um, but you ask them about the Communist Manifesto, they're like, yeah, communism is great. Um, we should all give more. Um, so, so share good education. And we wrote the book to be short so that you can get a couple copies and hand them out to your friends. Um, and then lastly, build parallel structures. That's what we're fundamentally doing here with Bitcoin. And, and I want to be clear about this. Bitcoin is not just, it's not even a fucking investment. I think investing is also a big scam. I think Bitcoin is a savings vehicle, but more importantly than that, it's a parallel money. You cannot have a parallel world without a parallel money. Money is the the most important technology of human civilization. You don't have civilization without money. Th those two things go hand in hand. Since we've had civilization, we've had money. Before we had civilization, we had no fucking money. Bitcoin is perfect money. And when I think about what it'll do to civilization, I think about this analogy. Imagine a blind man with an elastic tape measure trying to build a house. That's the world today. Like we're all fucking blind, trying to find our way through because we can't measure or judge our behavior or action. Pricing signals are all wrong, the money's all wrong, everything's all wrong, so, so we're getting mixed and bad feedback. Fixing the money is like that person who's blind and using an elastic tape measure, he becomes sighted and he's using a tape measure that's fixed. Think of the quality of the house or the quality of the structure that comes from the second or the ladder. That's the difference in civilization we have an opportunity to build with something like Bitcoin. Because we have signal, because we have accurate feedback, because we have localized consequence and responsibility for the actions and the, con of the, and the, for the, actions and the decisions we make. That's incredibly important. So I hope that this has been helpful. Uh, I don't know if I'm running out of time. Have I run out of time? We are off like uh, seven minutes already. <laughs> okay, all right. So I'll shut up now. I'll throw it out for questions because I think that's enough of me talking. I, I do have three books available, you know, because that's all I could carry in my luggage. So if anyone wants them, come see me afterwards. I'll sign them. And that's all I got. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, one question only. So. Oh, we got the one. Thank you for the talk. Thank you, man. Um, I'm a teacher, so I have 
like 100, 200 young minds every year. Bravo. And uh, uh, we have this, this thing I, I, I would call in English a cultural battle that we have lost because uh, we have like half a century of indoctrination. And I'm also guilty of that because in my early 20s, I'm, I was a lefty. I mean, who, who is not? We were so was I, man. I was a fucking vegan. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to cry over love songs. Fuck me. <laughs> Lots has changed. So my, my question is twofold. Is first is uh, when you say education, what, what, what do you think are the concrete actions on that education that we can take uh, with younger generations? Because they are in this world of serious pop culture, everything is pointing in another direction. And a question that I got asked a lot by my students is, uh, hey teacher, don't you recognize anything good about what uh, leftist ideologies have brought to, the brought to the table, or it's all wrong. So that's two questions I wanted to. Okay, so, so to that last question, I assume you're not teaching kindergarten. And no. Yeah, okay. H how old are they roughly? Uh, from 13 to 17. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah, uh, great time to be influencing. Um, I mean, I, I, I look at education and schooling as very different. Uh, the, the original premise behind schooling was to try and systemize education, but schooling has turned into just indoctrination, right? So I, I you know, Prince is here somewhere, he, I think he's written a book about uh, homeschooling. So, so I think education for me is something that happens all the time. And I mean, you throw someone on a plane, send them on a one-way ticket somewhere, and they're going to get educated in learning how to negotiate, learning how to talk, learning how to build rapport, learning like life skills. So I think... Education is uh, a process that we're all uh, doing at any point in time. And the younger you are, the more of a sponge your brain is, obviously, and you're, you're absorbing more things. I think this is a tricky question. I mean, I, I'm going to try and answer the first one um, as best as I can, which is probably going to be a shit answer anyway. But it's, it's to kind of give them more responsibility and more room to make mistakes where they have to own the mistakes themselves. There's that classic, have you heard the story about the, the teacher who, um, who gave everyone a test and then averaged out the scores? Yep, you know that one? Yeah, and then kind of averaged them all the way down to an F, right? Um, so, so kind of experiments like that or things where the, it's not just a, a written test or something they have to go and read and things like that. It's something that they do where they feel the effects of uh, doing something collectively down you know, downwards. So I think that kind of stuff is very important. I mean, finding good short uh, books and texts that they can read, because again, you know, we have a problem with attention span. So yeah, you, you don't give them fucking, uh, what's Mises' book? Uh, human action. You don't give them that and say, hey, look, your homework for today is three to thousand pages. Um, give them anatomy of the state. Give them this, if it's worthy of like being in that uh, realm, the uncommunist manifesto. Give them Give them the law by Bastiat, you know, and get them to read sections of that and understand it. Give them podcasts, you know, put them on, uh, get them to watch some YouTube uh, from people who actually have a brain and are talking about interesting things. And, and get them to, I mean, look at your own, you know, transformation into it. Um, give them, I mean, th this might be a bit more difficult to do, but I know with my kids, I'm going to get them to learn the appreciation of earning something uh, th as, as young at as much of a young age as possible. Um, and then I'm going to give them the experience of having to lose that um, by some unjust fashion. So I'm going to teach them to hate um, being stolen from at an early age. So I, so I think all of those kind of experiments, and, and I mean, I'm not a teacher, so I can't think of all these things now, but is, is that kind of helpful for the first question? Okay. I mean, it's probably shit you've already thought of, so I'm probably just reiterating. Um, but then, yeah, I, maybe that answers also the second question, is that if they think, if they're asking, is all leftism bad, then um, get them to behave in a leftist fashion in a small, uh, in a small environment. Now, th there could be a problem with that is because uh, leftist kind of communal ideology works at small scales, or, or it partially works, so, you know, it might be a little bit tricky, but 
I think, you know, once again, that, that essay experiment with the grades going all the way down is one of the best examples to, to teach these, um, these kids something. Another one might be also, like, if they like, uh, if they're interested in stories or narratives, get them onto people like Robert Heinlein, um, or Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand might be a little bit heavy for them, but you know Robert Heinlein at least is sci-fi. Um, you know, and probably the boys will like this more than the girls. But at least you know get them on a path towards that. And as they uh, read and understand that, like the stories will captivate them, and the protagonists are not some you know fucking social justice warrior. They're they're actual you know thinkers, and that that might you know push them in the right direction. But yeah, that's that's all I can think of. I hope that's helpful for everyone when we're thinking about how to educate. Thank you. Thank you. I really thought today that we would be amazing with the schedule. We are like 20 minutes away from the right time already. We'll try to catch up later. And now we have uh, Kim uh, from Spectre. What are we going to be talking? We're going to be talking about uh, mostly history about Spectre, and I will skip all the technical details very fast. Okay, so let's all give uh, him a warm welcome. Woo! Right, thank you. Camera would be here about. I, I'm not sure about the camera. Hi. Great. Um, take a seat. There are still some places left here. Great, so I'm Kim from uh, Spectre, and I would like to start to ask you who knows, who has some association with Spectre, somehow. Well, that's at least half about uh, the audience. Um, yeah, I'm, I will have a talk about uh, deploying Spectre desktop mechanism, not policy. Probably it will be a more like a history uh, of Spectre rather than uh, the technical details. So what's Spectre? So th that's, that's us. It started with Moritz and Stepan. Um, back at the time, they met at a conference like this. Uh, they said, OK, uh, what are you doing? Well, Moritz said, I don't know. I want to do something for, for Bitcoin. And Stepan, what would you do? And he said, I would create a hardware wallet, because all the other hardware wallets are friendly, uh, not so secure. So let's do that. Great. Let's start. Um, so Stepan started. Uh, that's me. I came later on. I'm mostly on Spectre desktop, not so much on Spectre hardware wallets. We come later to that. And we also have Manolis, uh, the director of reasons. We love titles. I'm the chief miscellaneous officer. Come on. Don't let me down. Next slide, please. <laughs> Here we go. That's how it started. It is. That uh, was some pictures. Uh, it started very roughly. They took some hardware platforms. This is already the final hardware platform. Uh, touch screen and a QR code scanner. Maybe some people did other stuff immediately took up all open source um, and we iterated on it. Then seed signer come in, created a case, looks like that. Um, then uh, Stepper was not happy because uh, it was a in-memory device, so why do you store the seed? <laughs> Keep trying. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, then we created um, something 
Like he, he searched for uh, what to what to use as a as a, a secure element and came up with these cards. You all have them in your pocket, and he created a, a, a smart card reader back in there. You can uh, store it there, and this was success. Uh, he was happy with that model. So, um, but we are iterating it, and it could get smaller. But supply chains, you know, it's on hold. Next slide, please. So he also had the problem like, um, how do we connect that? We should not do it in a centralized way. Let's do full solve several individual. Let's uh, install core, no one, it, maybe a lot of people had core, uh, and you should use your core back at the time, and no one know how. Well, Electrum, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, no one wants to do that. So we created Spectre Desktop, or he created Spectre Desktop which was a web application. Uh, you can download it and you can connect your node. And that was for the first time that you could do that. And also in combination with multi-signature. So this was a big deal back at the time. Next slide, please. Um, we also uh, later on um, put liquid in there. And um, yeah, and now questioning, who is using Spectre Desktop here? Well. Yeah, quarter of the room maybe, something a little bit less. Uh, yeah, so um, you could use now Liquid, um, then we created later on some functionality maybe for the Liquid, uh, uh, for the uh, bonds uh, later on we came. And um, next slide, please. And that's, this is our repository, so we have full open source, and I would say that in the meantime, I'm uh, mostly maintaining the repo and uh, reviewing, um, we have a lot of commenters. Uh, they are hacking like crazy. We have Keith Mukai, who is currently doing a seed signer stuff. He created uh, the HWI integration so that you can use all your wallets, ledger, treasure, what you have. Um, then uh, Ben Kaufman did uh, downloading your core, so because you can, in, inside the uh, application, install a core if you don't have that. Let it run in. Uh, you can use it pruned node. You can uh, download it in a quick sync format. So pre-configured or pre-synced uh, from Stepan, he's running that service. And uh, that will bring you up and running in about 20 minutes from nothing other than your laptop. Next slide, please. So back at the time, as I said, that was a huge deal. People uh, thought about spectre maximalism. That was a thing. And we were really, really thrilled. Matt O'Dell, Stefan Rivera, all were really um, thrilled by that. And it, 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 that gave us uh, some confidence to move on and, and, and continue on that. We, we are on the right track. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, so why don't you want to lose it? I already told it, you're a real Bitcoiner, use your node. You will have some hardware wallets. You might want to use multi-sig. Multi it's very flexible to use. I call it a Swiss Army knife for your Swiss bank in your pocket. So um, yeah, and it's very extensible. It's for the self-sovereign individual, but also in the future increasingly be used by corporations because they have more requirements, want to fulfill different requirements. And that is what I, uh, I think is important and mechanism, not policy. So we want to make things possible, and that's why sometimes it might be a little bit more complex and not the right tool for uh, some, some pre-coin. Next slide, please. Yeah, here we have, uh, if you run your own node, you can, you can use Raspberry Blitz, you can use Citadel, run Citadel, shout out to our own, very good work. My node, uh, Start9, Umbral, you name it. Uh, please, next slide. But you can also, um, yeah, you, you can use a pip installation, you can use Docker images, you can, we have OS specific apps, which is probably the, the stuff which is used by the uh, beginners. You can, uh, yeah, you can access it via the app on your laptop, you can access it via HTTPS, via Tor. You can have your full node somewhere on your laptop. It's uh, very flexible, you can use USB or QR based uh, hardware wallets or uh, like uh, cold card, uh, upload, download. So 
a lot of flexibility, and uh, we will rush now through a couple of slides. Next slide, please. So that's the default one. Next slide. Yeah, then you can uh, maybe have a, a note somewhere else. We have pros, we have cons. Uh, the slides will be available, right? But uh, it's, it's very difficult because everything is a trade-off decision. And these setups are, next slide please, trade-off decisions. So you, you might have want to have on the left side here, you see three uh, hardware wallets representing a cold card with uh, uploading uh, with SD cards uh, in your browser or a Trezor with a USB or here what we have is a hardware wallet um, from us, so it's representing QR codes, but by the way, we are supporting all of that, also USB, also um, uh, SD cards. Next slide. Yeah, you might want to install it, install this uh, Spectre on your slide, uh, on, on, on your computer, and then run it in Umbrella. Next slide. You better do that with Tailscale. If you're an Umbrella user, you want to use uh, Spectre on your computer, use Tailscale, please, not Tor. Next slide. Yeah, here we come to something like people want to use Electrum all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah, so there are some use cases. So we have a Spectre Cloud coming up, and we created a Spectrum, which is an adapter which is uh, behaving like a Bitcoin Core node uh, from an API point of view, and then calling a Electrum server in the back end. And we can use that to scale it up. And uh, uh, maybe if you want to use a Leptum for some reason, we will uh, make that spectrum also available uh, for self sovereign individual. That is, uh, yeah, and then you can use whatever Electrum server you like. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's uh, some intermediate step. Next slide. That's the future for Plats. So that we um, put spectrum inside uh, Spectre in order to make it accessible to you. So we created now an extension concept which should make it possible to, to fulfill your requirements. For example, for something like that. But we have also other use cases. You effectively don't know what stuff is coming up from a requirements point of view. So uh, that's the reason why you need a very flexible existen extension framework. So maybe next slide. And we have already some, and we we effectively we're shipping them with the core products. So here you see the ones which are currently shipped with the core product. Uh, the first one was a Swan extension, um, in in order to connect your uh, your stacking to Swan much easier. Then we had the second one was a Liquid issuer, um, which hopefully will be used soon. We all <laughs> think. Bonds, please come, yeah. Um, and then uh, what, what we also have, we released it a couple of uh, days ago, is something which uh, Samson wanted to have, the X fund service where you're creating an Excel and uh, you have lots of uh, addresses uh, and different amounts or same amounts. You want to label uh, the, UTX, uh, the, the transactions and then you copy paste that as a CSV into Spectre and then you can uh, easily create huge PSPTs. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, coming, uh, if Keith releases it uh, sooner or later, he creates the slush pool in, uh, integration, which is also a, a great one for, for people who are doing mining. So we have already a system where you can do your extension in an own repo. So it's uh, decoupled, so you don't have to create a PR in our repository in order to uh, extend um, uh, Spectre. Next slide, please. So I'm not sure whether you can read it, and I'm not sure whether it even animated, but it should, and it probably doesn't because this is a PDF or something like that. But this should uh, tell you something about how easy it is to create an extension. It takes you three minutes, and the only thing you need is Python on your, on your laptop. And then you will uh, have, uh, after three minutes, the, tem the templating, uh, which uh, makes it possible for you to immediately jump in. And if you know PHP or something like that, or Flask, uh, it's built in Flask, then you will immediately fe feel at home and you can directly contribute functionality towards Spectre yeah, desktop and um, yeah, 
that's it. So uh, I, I would love to, to also have some questions. Woo! That was great. <laughs> so, questions? Don't let me down. I want questions. I have seven minutes have for my questions, at least. Please, go. The, uh, the Tor connection. You were, require, or you were recommending not to use the Tor, but to use another application. Why, why is that? Well, uh, that, that was a specific uh, uh, issue with Umbral. And uh, that is that you have your uh, Spectre on your laptop, and then you're using via Tor the core API. This is not a good idea because the core API is not performant on Tor. Forget, don't use it. There are people who even are happy with it, and I don't get it because if I try that, it's, I, I'm too to do high preference or I don't know. So uh, this is not true for Electrum. Uh, the API of Electrum, that's the reason why it's so much easier. Uh, so that's the reason why you should ta use TailScale for Umbral. It's built into Umbral, but you, maybe you want to not use Umbral. Uh, Citadel is also good. Uh, we have lots of uh, great uh, node implementations and uh, Citadel f is one of them. And Citadel from, from our own shout out. Yes. From what I understand, the main reason for using Electrum is that it indexes all stuff beforehand, while Bitcoin Core doesn't really. Is there a, if you add a new ad, uh, wallet that is already created, it has some history, do you need to rescan the whole Bitcoin blockchain for that? Yeah, if you use, uh, the, the that's a good question, uh, so it depends on, uh, if you use Bitcoin Core or if you're using Spectrum. So if it's Spectrum, your wallet is just immediately uh, up and running. We have that in the cloud now running and yeah, no, you don't need that. If you use Bitcoin Core, the question is, have, do you have a pruned node or do you have a full node? Um, if you have a full node, then uh, you're completely private because you can do it completely within. If you have a pruned node, then do you want to use a UTXO scan? Yeah, then you don't have to ask anyone, but then you don't have history. So if you want to have history, uh, then you have to give up a little bit privacy. And for example, over Tor, over 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 ClearNet, you can ask uh, Blockstream services to add the history, and then you there's a checkbox in there who can do that. Answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Um, are there any ideas for additional plugins uh, so far? Uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there is. There's one. Who knows Alpha Zeta? So Alpha Zeta created the first extension. It w it was uh, something. It, this is the biggest thing. I'm so excited about. We have a lot of extensions, right? Uh, this one, uh, we will release really that soon. So he's a, a kind of hedge fund guy, and he he, um, he created a tool uh, where you can. Yeah, I, I, he it's to, to to judge whether you have made a good investment and all these kind of things. I think that's for Giacomo trader guys uh, kind of extension. I'm not that guy. I'm more like a developer. But then you can have graphs and compare it to S and P 500 and Red Not Not and probably IOTA and Ethereum. I don't know, but this is a great one, and uh, we will we will modify it so that it will be shipped as an extension. This is coming up. We have a very experimental Moonshot loan service extension, uh, which uh, is, is helps you to, to, to manage your uh, loans to, to someone with liquid and uh, bo uh, like uh, uh, having it as a collateral, Bitcoin as a collateral. We have a spot bit extension coming up. And uh, I don't know, maybe you, you create the next one. Yes. Uh, is there any way to uh, verify if a wallet is using the uh, whispering uh, system? Because I heard some wallets in the past that were just exposing the X public key instead. Uh, I mean, rather than reading the code. Uh, I'm not familiar with the whispering system, to be honest. Well, uh, I'm not expert in that matter, but as far as I know, it's like the way when you uh, do a transaction is like, when you ask for the balance, you know, it's like you don't ask for this address to 
uh, a specific node. You ask for many addresses for privacy reasons. So well, that, that, that's you, you might do that if you're using Electrum. Yeah. But if you use your own Bitcoin Core node, you can uh, privately do it because it's your node, and uh, then you you don't need. You have to make sure that uh, the um, the number of addresses which your uh, wallet is uh, tracking is big enough so that you catch all the history. There are some FAQ on on the side uh, on our pages where you have th these kinds of questions. Um, but that's completely privacy fine if it's a full node. And then the other one, th th we had that question over there. Which yeah. was what? If if you expose the XPUB from yeah. privacy concern, I don't think you do that because uh, if you do the OTXO scan, then uh, the addresses individually get collected, not the XPUB. Uh, we had a question over there. Some. Um, so should I air gap or not air gap? Ah, and that's what's the an best awesome way? <laughs> wow, next question. Uh, no, I, no? We, we don't have any more questions, so I have to answer you as well. So I think, I think that there are, uh, I'm just learning about uh, some of the security trade-offs about air gap and non-air gap. I'm uh, convinced that uh, air gapping is a very good idea. And the question is, or the argument is, that the attack vector is uh, not so often uh, via USB. So the wallets which are using USB, they say something like, well, there no, never been a hack, so <laughs> there will be never one in the future. Might be a good idea. So I think there's a lot of um, technology coming on, which, which is making stuff uh, more secure. And I think there are a lot of things also uh, you have to take into account which kind of um, attack your you want to prevent yeah and for example I think that uh, for example there's an, an um, exfiltration uh, yeah, anti exfiltration right so I think that's uh, one thing which you probably want to use if you have address you re reuse something like that right this is something that if your if your hardware wallet got stolen something like that so um, what happens is do you have a secure element, is the pin broken? So I think it's a very complex question, and I'm very looking forward to the next talk, which will go in much detail here. Ah, okay, here. And uh, yeah, maybe I have some questions for you as well. Okay, uh, so- Last question. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so much in time, so I have some benefit of a last question. Uh, no, we're, uh, we're uh, I think we're out now. Uh, okay. So thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. And, and now we're gonna need like two, three minutes because uh, we have like some technical issues there. But uh, yeah, now coming up, uh, Douglas yeah. from uh, Ship, and he's uh, you're gonna be talking about air. We'll talk about air gap. That's yeah. gonna be very interesting. So yeah, just uh, two minutes, and we will start.